Okay, members, you're all very welcome to a meeting of the uh, Justice Committee. If um, members can do their needful with electronic devices, and if you can mute yourself until um, you're called in, if you're joining us by the Starley facility. So, if there's any declarations of interest members have, financial or otherwise, related to today's uh, agenda items, now would be the appropriate time to declare them. If not, we'll. Proceed. There's apologies from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan, and we are joined by uh, Doug Beatty, Rachel Woods, Linda Dillon, and Sinead Bradley, and Gemma at Dolan via the Starley facility, and you're all welcome. So I'll ask the clerk um, just to advise if any members have delegated their vote under the relevant standing orders. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote under standing order 1156 to you as chairperson. And Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. So, draft minutes of the meeting um, that were held on the 25th of February, pages 5 to 9. If members are content that they're a true reflection of the proceedings, then I can sign them accordingly. Members content? Great. Okay. Uh, matters arising. Um, a response from the Department providing clarification of the change in the gross provision in respect of AMI for Legal Services Agency Northern Ireland in the spring supplementary estimates is in the meeting pack, and that was emailed to members on Monday in advance of the debates. The Department has also advised that the Committee's response to the draft budget will be considered along with responses from business areas, and the Committee will be provided with an update on the Department's priorities in the context of the final budget settlement when that is Available. So, if members are content, we'll schedule a further briefing on the budget, uh, a further briefing session on the budget outcome and priorities for the meeting to take place. Uh, that's taking place on the 15th of April. If members are content, content. Item two of matters arising: the Department of Finance led the supplementary page to the spring supplementary estimates on the 1st of March. And that's also in your meeting pack and was emailed in advance of the debate on Monday. In relation to the Department of Justice, it seeks provision for expenditure on a recruitment and retention allowance to eligible county court judges in Northern Ireland in the absence of a specific statutory provision. The committee noted information provided by the Department on the issue at the meeting on the 10th of September. So again, members, it's just to note the supplementary page to the spring. Uh, estimates, unless any further information is required, be duly noted. Noted. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, item three um, is around the damages return on investment bill. The department has provided a response to the request for further information on the current rate of the court process and the court's capacity in relation to civil cases compared to the same time last year, uh, following the oral evidence session with the minister and officials on the 28th of January. The relevant information is in your meeting pack, so members can note that information um, unless any further clarity is needed in that area. Um, just to inform members that there has also been a response in this area from the Minister for Finance regarding the wider financial implications for the executive and government departments of the proposed bill, uh, have, and uh, that is on page 27 of the tabled pack. So the Finance Minister has indicated that it would be for the Department of Justice to lead on any analysis needed to understand the financial impact of policy or legislation changes as the Department uh, is bringing forward the legislation. His officials are continuing to engage with colleagues in the Justice Department on the matter. So, members, again, it is there for noting, unless there is any further information members need on that correspondence. Then, on this uh, issue, uh, just to inform members that the Assembly Speaker replied to the Committee's letter seeking his views on the correspondence from the Minister of Justice, indicating that the Executive had agreed to the introduction of the Damages Bill with a condensed Committee stage that would need to be concluded by 30 April and the provision of an indicative timeline providing 27 working days for Committee stage. Um, that can be found in your tabled pack pages 23 and 24. So the Speaker has indicated that he does have an interest in upholding the scrutiny and accountability functions of the Assembly, and states that the Assembly's role of scrutinising legislation is one for the Assembly to exercise independently. Uh, he confirms that it is for the Assembly to, do, to decide, by way of a cross-community vote, whether accelerated passage for a bill uh, would be granted, and that the Executive has no role in determining the length of a committee's consideration of a bill. He also highlights that there have been examples where committees uh, have accepted time pressures in relation to the passage of specific pieces of legislation, 
Um, indeed, uh, it's not in his letter, but uh, members will know we did that when it came to the domestic abuse legislation as one of uh, such examples. Um, but the Speaker's letter goes on to say that it is for each committee to consider the validity of the case made to it and the options open to it in relation to conducting any scrutiny within that time period. The Speaker also indicates that the granting then of accelerated passage and shortening the Assembly scrutiny process is something which should only be done exceptionally and for good reason, and the Committee then is right to be proactively engaging with the Minister on this matter. So, members, again, that uh, correspondence is there for noting, unless uh, any members are wishing to um, elaborate on it. Um, just to advise, the second stage of the damages bill is on the order paper um, for next week. It will be on the uh, 9th of March that that is taking place. Um, I also raised this matter at the uh, Chairperson's Liaison Group on Monday, where there was some discussion around it. And the uh, outworkings of that is that the Chairman Liaison Group is also going to uh, be corresponding uh, with the Speaker uh, in respect of the concerns that have been raised and discussed by us here on the uh, Justice Committee. So, members, that's just an update in terms of that damages bill. Second stage debate um, will be next uh, next week on the 9th of March. Uh, subject to that being successfully uh, voted through the assembly, then it comes to this committee, uh, and at that point, the committee will then need to determine uh, the kind of scrutiny it wishes to uh, apply to the bill. Item four then is uh, an update on funding and planning for phase two of the executive programme for tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime. The Minister has written uh, to the committee providing an update uh, in respect of phase two of this uh, programme and the associated funding. The letters are in the tabled pack. So just advise members, thirteen million pounds is being provided in twenty twenty one twenty two for the programme and then an additional £10 million from the New Decade New Approach funding is to be profiled across the three years of the Phase 2 programme for the Communities in Transition project. Uh, the programme now has two overarching objectives, um, that is people and communities being safe from harm caused by paramilitarism, and people and communities are more resilient to paramilitary influence and involvement in paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime, and details of how the funding will be allocated and information on the projects to be funded in 2021-22 have been provided. Uh, the Committee received an oral briefing on the proposed new programme uh, at our meeting that took place on the 26th of November last year, following which members indicated uh, that they uh, wish to have further engagement um, and discussion with officials on the second phase of the programme when there was clarity on the funding uh, position. So, members, an oral briefing on the Phase Two program uh, is scheduled into the Forward Work program, and that's to take place um, before, obviously, the summer recess. So that meeting uh, will be organised in due course. Okay, members. So, if I can move on to Agenda Item Four, which um, is the draft Adult Restorative Justice Strategy for Northern Ireland, and it's a summary of the consultation responses and the proposed. Next steps. So we do have um, officials here attending the meeting um, to outline the results of the public consultation on the development uh, of this strategy and the proposed next steps. The relevant uh, papers, members, are pages 35 through to 191 of the meeting. So I'm delighted to be able to welcome in person um, the officials that are joining with us, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we're not going to have the technical glitches um, that have plagued some of our sessions. So um, most of our members are actually via the, the remote facility, um, but nevertheless, um, I'm, I'm very pleased to have officials here. This room is more than suitable and adequate in terms of accommodating people coming in, and the appropriate uh, risk assessments and all of that have been carried out. So. Uh, I certainly welcome uh, officials being here in person uh, to be able to engage uh, with me and the committee. So, can I formally welcome Paul Doran, Director of Rehabilitation, and Stephen McCourt, who is Head of Rehabilitation, Resettlement, and Reducing Reoffending from the Department. And the session will be reported by Hansard and a transcript of which they then published in due course. So, I'm going to hand over to yourselves to provide an outline, and then we'll pick it up from there. So, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are very pleased to be able to brief the Committee on the Department's plans for an adult restorative justice strategy for Northern Ireland. 
and in particular on the responses we received to the public consultation that was held last year. This is a piece of work that has been in development for a number of years. It was always the intention to expand on the successful introduction of restorative justice in the youth justice system and to build on the important community-based work that had grown from the desire to find legitimate alternatives to paramilitary assaults. The absence of an assembly and a minister of justice's sign off the development of a new policy held up this work for some time, along with the desire to consider the implications of the Fresh Start panel report and its recommendations around restorative justice. It is good, therefore, to see it finally come to fruition. The consultation itself ran from June to September 2020, although a number of responses were accepted after this date to inform the way forward. Obviously, it was not ideal having to consult during a pandemic, but we were reluctant to postpone the work any further, given the already considerable delays we had experienced. We therefore provided an extended consultation period of 12 weeks and arranged for a range of response methods to be used, both online and via hard copy templates. An easy read version was also produced to simplify the key points in what was a very detailed consultation document. Over 500 individuals and organisations were issued with links to the consultation. Key stakeholders were also offered the option of virtual consultation events online, but most were content to respond on the basis of the consultation document. A number of umbrella organisations, in particular the Restorative Practice Forum, Victim Support NI and Women's Aid Federation, sought feedback from their stakeholders in advance of providing a consolidated response from each organisation. As you will have seen from your briefing paper, a total of 41 responses were ultimately received, with 39 of these providing answers to some or all of the consultation questions with varying degrees of detail. The other two responses were short covering letters of endorsement. We were very pleased that there was overwhelming support for the development of an adult restorative justice strategy. It was viewed as a significant opportunity to develop a more progressive, effective and accountable justice system, which importantly could give increased voice to and minimal, meaningful engagement with victims of crime. Some of the respondents qualified their support on the basis that a strategy would need to have a strong rights-based approach, put victims first and ensure that all engagements as part of a restorative process were voluntary in nature. We would agree with all these views. For a process to be truly restorative, it cannot be coercive in any way or to any party engaged in it. I will return to this point shortly. In addition to the need for this victim's first focus, both the summary of responses report and the briefing paper issued to the committee highlight a number of key issues raised by respondents to the consultation. I will therefore not rehearse them all here, but there are a few which I would like to touch on. First, if we are to successfully deliver a strategic, coordinated approach to the use of restorative justice at all stages of the adult justice system, this will require equality of provision for all. This means the same services will need to be offered for all victims and offenders across Northern Ireland, regardless of their location. Clearly, given the currently limited number and location of trained and accredited practitioners, there are capacity issues which will need to be addressed. Alongside this, there will inevitably be issues around the funding of such services. The need for long-term funding for restorative practices was recognised by the Fresh Start panel and led to recommendation A9, which called on the executive to establish a dedicated fund for this work. This call was echoed by many respondents to the consultation, who recognised that the current short-term nature of funding was restricting both the use and the potential development of restorative interventions. It also hindered planning for the longer term, given the uncertainty of budgets. This could lead to staff turnover with organisations losing trained and experienced staff. As a department, we recognise the need to provide funding to underpin the development of an adult strategy. But given the potential for wider application of restorative approaches in communities and the fact that the executive has been tasked with providing a long-term fund for this work, 
We believe it is vital to cooperate in this to ensure a coordinated approach which offers effectiveness, accountability and value for money. The next issue I want to mention is the identified need for a review of the 2007 Government Protocol, which governs the accreditation of community-based restorative justice groups and referrals to them from criminal justice organisations. This protocol was a product of its time, but is now more than 13 years old and was seen by many respondents as a barrier to referrals rather than an enabler. While most welcomed the robust accreditation and governance structures it delivers and did not wish to see a dilution of this process, there was a clear view that a review of the protocol and its operation should be carried out with the aim of increasing appropriate referrals from statutory bodies and expanding the work of restorative practice more generally. The Minister is very much of the same opinion and wished to be provided with assurances that the accreditation of any new schemes will be undertaken against a process which is up to date and fit for purpose. She has therefore asked us to prioritise a review of the protocol as we take forward the work on the strategy. Finally, there was a small but important number of respondents who believed that there were certain offences, in particular those dealing with domestic abuse and sexual offences, which were not appropriate for the use of restorative justice, given the potential for coercive control and re-victimisation due to the nature and circumstances of the offences. These are complex and sensitive issues, and we completely understand these views. However, they must be considered alongside the evidence presented in the consultation document, which shows restorative approaches can be successful in some of these cases, and also the recommendations in the Gildan Report which proposed the use of restorative justice both alongside as an, and as an alternative to the formal justice system. In taking forward on the development of an adult restorative justice strategy, we will need to take cognizance of these issues and ensure we engage with all relevant stakeholders as it progresses. This will include our colleagues across the department who are working on a range of issues which lend themselves to a restorative approach including implementation of the review of sentencing, recommendations from both the Gillen and Marlin reports, and more generally, those operating within the community safety arena. It is our intention to finalise an adult strategy and associated action plan over the coming months, and these will be subject to ministerial and justice committee consideration in due course. We are happy to take questions, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, and just to pick up on that last area then around some of the sensitivities to do with domestic abuse, paramilitary and, and so on. It, so it, it, it seems to me, in terms of what you're saying, that the plan will be still that this restorative justice scheme um, or, or action plan will seek to include domestic abuse, paramilitary type offences as an area in which restorative justice could be engaged. And that kind of takes me to the supplementary on that. Will this still be a voluntary process for participants to get involved in? Certainly, uh, Chair, the issue of domestic abuse will be something that we would be considering because there are two recommendations in the Gillen report uh, regarding the use of restorative practice for serious sexual offences. And obviously, there was a lot of uh, debate and consideration about those recommendations and a lot, a lot of strong views expressed on both sides. So it is our intention to. Con to ensure that uh, those recommendations are considered as part of the strategy. Um, in terms of involvement in paramilitary offending, um, a lot of the work that has been going on to date um, has been delivered by uh, community-based organisations, and we believe they have added value to the process, particularly in those communities where some of the justice agencies have difficulty in, in getting traction. So we'll, we will be looking at, at all um, aspects of offending behaviour in the, in the uh, draft strategy. Um, in terms of um, getting buy-in um, from, from the community, we feel it is very important that um, the, the statutory bodies and the community-based organisations work together. And, and I, to answer the second part of your question, I think that um, a volunteerism is an important principle. Um, we, we believe it is very important that victims are at front and centre of any restorative justice strategy. And certainly, um, the involvement of victims is, is critical to its success. Um, we, we are looking, obviously, at the, the success of the youth justice um, restorative approaches. 
and that's obviously a justice-led um, initiative rather than you know victim-led. And there are uh, offences that can proceed even in the absence of a victim input, but that has worked well for young people. However, we will be learning from that, but not necessarily applying all the learning from from the youth justice um, um, scheme, because we believe that there are different issues for for adults. Okay, no, that that's helpful, and certainly I know examples where restorative justice with young people has worked and worked well. Um, you know, so obviously it's it's a tool that can be usefully deployed, but I think that voluntary aspect is important. You know, if somebody doesn't want to, to engage through that process, particularly a victim, you know, that they shouldn't have to and, and seek to, to go through an alternative. In terms of the, the, the vetting of particular schemes, um, that process has, has now re-engaged as far as I'm aware. I, I know there had been some issues in the past around um, the, 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 I think it was Claire Sugden actually had been wanting to take it forward and then there were issues highlighted. So if you can just update us on, on where that process currently now is. Yeah, I'll start and I'll ask Stephen, who will provide some of the detail on it, uh, Chair. The process was, as you say, paused back in 2016. And the reason for that pause was uh, there was an expectation that the Fresh Start Agreement would, would address some of the issues in relation to accreditation. Um, also, a feasibility study on the Centre of Restorative Excellence was to be uh, developed and that, that reported in 2018. And then, of course, we had the uh, suspension of the Assembly and the unavailability of, of the Minister and the Committee. Um, and then there was a, another a slight technical issue just about recommencing the accreditation process, which the Stephen will deliver. But certainly it's our view that we our priority now is to review the 2007 protocol because it has served its purpose, but it certainly needs to be um, re uh, amended now and adjusted to take account of uh, the current circumstances in 2021 and also to increase the, the number of referrals. But I'll maybe ask Stephen just to do a bit of the detail on the, uh, the issues about accreditation. Yes, yeah, certainly, uh, Chair. As Paul has already said, the protocol, the, the 2007 protocol from government, um, sets out a very clear framework in relation to the accreditation organisations, which, which is built in, in, in two particular aspects. One is uh, a very rigorous process of inspection by a criminal justice inspectorate, but also then separately to that is a suitability panel focusing in relation to individuals that may be coming forward in relation to accreditation. Um, there, there were a number of technical issues in relation to this, um, and we have already come to the committee and made you aware in relation to the fact at the time of the devolution of policing and justice, the provisions under section 43 of the 2007 Justice and Security Act were not transferred over in relation to a devolved uh, context, and we have had to take steps to, to address that situation, and we have done that in two ways. Uh, one is we've brought forward separately uh, agency arrangements with the Secretary of State to allow the Justice Minister to access the powers in relation to accreditation under that legislation. So that takes care of the here and now. And then separately, we're bringing forward provisions under the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill that will be coming before the committee to rectify the problem in statute uh, permanently in terms of that. But you will have seen from your papers in relation to the committee that actually the review of the 2007 protocol is a key area that all respondents in relation to the consultation has set out because they believe whilst, whilst the processes and safeguards that are embedded in relation to the protocol are critical moving forward uh, in terms of it, but there's also an opportunity in relation to setting it appropriately in context in relation to where we are today in terms of the use of restorative justice, but it has come a considerable way since 2007 in terms of to its use now. And in particular, one of the areas in relation to looking how we can improve its use within the justice system in terms of expanding the number of referrals uh, that are coming forward within the justice system itself. So the Minister is very keen in terms of providing a level of assurance. Uh, in terms of governance and in terms of the suitability of people that would be operating within that scheme, um, that that would be the first piece of work that we would do uh, in terms of the parallel other areas of work within criminal justice that we will that we will be reviewing that protocol first off. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, let me bring in just some other members at this stage. I, I'm 
may come back on a couple of points, but in the first instance, if I can bring in the, the vice chair of the committee, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. No problem. That's brilliant. Thank you. And thank you for the, for the presentation. And you've actually answered some of my questions in, in, in your briefing, uh, particularly in relation to the accreditation process and, and the review of that. So I think that is vitally important, particularly around the referrals, because, I mean, it is clear to be seen that, that one of the, the downfalls of the process is the, the lack of referrals, and I think that is something that absolutely has to be addressed because, as the chair has already alluded to, and I certainly know from from my own experience within um, our communities that restorative justice, when it is applied and applied well, works well. Um, the, the chair also spoke to the issue of the need for um, it to be voluntary, both on on the side of the, in relation to the victim and the the perpetrator or alleged perpetrator um, I, I think that is extremely important because you have to be dealing with, with people that want to and are able to engage with this process and you may well have victims who are just not able to engage with the process particularly if we're going to include some of the issues that, that you've outlined around domestic abuse and, and, and other types of offences which I think it is important they're included but it, there has to be the right checks and balances and safeguards in order to protect victims and, and and particularly those who may well be under the influence of coercive control, so all of, all of those are extremely important um, points. I think it is important to point out. Sometimes people think that restorative justice is, is a bit airy fairy, and it's very much and weighted in favour of of perpetrators or those guilty of of an offence, but actually victims. And, and we have seen this through the, through the process, gain a lot from this as well in terms of maybe their own fears around what has happened whenever they actually are, are in a position where they meet with, in some circumstances, face-to-face -face the perpetrator. They get a very different understanding of what has happened to them and it's helpful to them in the process. So I, I think these are issues that are really important and do benefit victims. Just in terms of, sorry for... Thank you for your, your leeway there, Chair. But to, to come to, I suppose, a specific question in relation to the um, the protocol, what, what will be the, the scope of the review? Do you have any idea of what that will look like? Um, again, I'll kick off, Chair, and maybe ask Stephen to, to come in. Um, I think all aspects of the review will be considered. Um, obviously, there are, are a number of elements to the protocol. Um, the first one is the, the, the fact that um, uh, the governance arrangements of the, uh, the community-based restorative organisations um, has to be uh, meet, meet all the, the tests for good governance. Um, we, we will be um, looking at, at the elements of uh, where the referrals are coming from, and therefore we'll work closely with our partners in the justice system. The organisations involved are the police, um, the PPS, um, the Probation Board for Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Prison Service, and along with uh, Victim Support Northern Ireland, and the two accredited groups, which is Northern Ireland Alternatives and Community Based Restorative Justice. Um, as Stephen has already alluded to, um, there is a two part accreditation process. And the first part is an inspection by Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland. Um, and we certainly see that as being something that should be retained. It gives an independent oversight of the uh, uh, of the governance process. The second element of the accreditation process is the consideration of the suitability of, of the staff involved, and that is under a panel with an independent chair. And again, you know, the principles of that are, are sound, so I don't think that there will be huge changes in, in those core principles. Um, but the other part that you referred to, uh, Vice Chair, in your opening remarks is the very small number of referrals from the um, statutory justice agencies, particularly the Public Prosecution Service, um, and that's something certainly we'd be looking at. I think there is strong evidence of um, strong partnerships between the PSNI and the two accredited um, community-based groups, and also the Probation Board have used them both in their enhanced combination order, alternative to short prison sentence disposal, uh, and used them very successfully. Um, but I think that the, probably the, the key issue is how can we get 
uh, an increase in the referrals from particularly the PPS uh, and also uh, PSNI and, and possibly PBNI. I don't know, Stephen, if you want to add to that. Well, ju just to add to it, um, but what, one of the areas that we have found is that in terms of the use of restorative practice more generally, um, the significant area of the use of restorative practice is outside the justice system. Uh, in terms of, and particularly at community level, and particularly in relation to areas that are funded by the Department of Communities or the Housing Executive or whatever, in those various fields in relation to looking at low-level housing disputes, etc., uh, and in terms of uh, addressing the, the various needs in, in communities to reduce tension uh, and resolve disputes. But the protocol in itself doesn't cover the use of restorative practice outside the justice system. And that, and that is something that actually, in terms of providing safeguards and assurance in relation to uh, any groups or individuals engaged within that process, that, that that is potentially something in terms of the scope of review that we will be looking at. Because the Department of Communities and Housing Executive use the protocol and the accreditation of community-based restorative justice groups at the moment to provide a level of reassurance in relation to people that they would fund uh, in terms to deliver services for them. But actually, that's not what the way the protocol is set out to do. Uh, and that's something in particular that we would like to focus on in relation to, in terms of its you know, being fit for purpose uh, at this stage in relation to something that the scope of the review could focus on. Chair, just if, if I can just make one other point, um, I think that I mean it was mentioned there in the the community and the, the importance of. I, I just think we need to generate that and talk about the, the centre of excellence and, and the strategy moving forward. The reason that those um, organisation started just just work because there's been a feedback to I don't know if I'm term maybe have unmuted, but um, the, the, issue, the reason that they work so well is because they are based in the community, they're rooted in the community, they grew up out of the community, that's that's by people within those communities, and I think that it's really important to ensure that whatever we do going forward, that that isn't captured, because high level does not work for communities. Things that work in communities are things that are grown up out of communities, and that are based within communities with people who understand those those communities and our community as a whole, actually. And that's not to take away anything from any anything that anybody would do at a high level, but we know and, and we constantly discuss this around PSNA and the need for policing with the community, the the importance of things growing up out of community. That's where that's your starting point. Your starting point is within the community and then everything comes from that and feeds up into the top level, not the other way around. And that's why this works. And we need to make sure that we can capture that going forward. And I think it's just important to make that point to the officials in the department at this point to make sure we don't lose that. that you know, if we lose that, we will have lost the, the richness that we have in, in community restorative justice. So thank you for, for coming to the committee and, and for listening to the not only the questions, but the concerns and the points that we want to make. Here today, so I, I appreciate them. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from you. Just in terms of, I know that the the briefing is is called next steps, but we really haven't seen what the next steps are going to be and the actions out of this. And I look forward probably to that that being, um, you know, us, us seeing what that's going to look like. But I suppose in terms of the talking about the review and things like that, that is part of the next steps. But in, in terms of seeing what the actions are actually going to be what we're going to see coming out of this. I look forward to that and look forward to seeing you and engaging with you again. Thank you. Chair, Chair if, yes, I, if I could add just in relation to providing a level of reassurance that um, in terms of the review of the protocol, what ideally we would like to see is uh, the use of restorative practice at all stages within the community. So we would like to encourage youth groups, church groups, educational settings, whatever, that embed the use of restorative practice generally. And that, that is one of the key areas that we can't lose that community focus in relation to the use of restorative practice, because there is a, there is a wide continuum all the way through to, to the justice use and within the justice sector. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, Sinead Bradley. Thank you. Chair, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. And thanks to Paul and Stephen for the uh, presentation so far. Just in terms, it's just building on some of the questions that have already been asked, to be fair, a lot has been gone through. In terms of then the, um, you know, I'm going back on that proposed review of the protocols. And I suppose I would like to know, um, you, you speak about the two layers of sort of scrutiny that are there, the inspection from the CGI and uh, but that second piece then, um, I think we, well, I presume I understand who that is and, you know, but I would wonder who, who sets the standards for what that inspection process looks like and would you anticipate any review of the protocol shaking that up in any way significant? And then the second layer, um, which is the, the piece where you look at um, bringing in the community aspects of it, I, you talk about the suitability panel. Who who elects who should be on that suitability panel? And is that a structure that you feel is working? And is it within the gift of, um, albeit, you know, I know you referred to this um, sort of temporary arrangement, agency arrangement with the minister, is it within the minister's gift um, to change that? Or you know if, if if she considered there'd be a problem within it, I just want to know who's setting the standards. And whilst you know there can be a real win-win from restorative justice, I don't think anybody would argue different. And um, you know if, if it is in that voluntary capacity, but I just would be cautious about the parameters we set on what the standards are, you know, on suitability, etc. So any thoughts on that? I'd really appreciate just a better understanding. Thank you. In terms, just just a, a number of things. The standards that are set out within the protocol, um, there, there are a number of standards. There are inspection standards that Sijini would set, and they're and they're based on international standards in relation to the use of restorative practice. Um, in terms of that, so Sijini have a, a a particular framework that they use in relation to expect, inspecting these organisations and what they would like to see in terms of of their inspection and the various standards that they have to meet. Um, and the second aspect in relation to the suitability panel, the suitability panel is made up of the of the chief executive of the probation board, the chief executive of the youth justice agency, and an independent member. Uh, and that is, and the information that grows in front of that panel is obviously the outcome of the inspection in relation to Sijini, in terms of the organisation working in that geographical area, but also then the information in relation to criminal record information in relation to individuals who will be working within the scheme, and then there is an opportunity for the PSNI to also provide wider. Uh, information in relation to the operation of either individuals or the scheme in terms of information that they may have in terms of its work within an individual community or uh, wider information in relation to an individual that they are aware of uh, in terms of the community setting and the panel then consider as to whether or not in terms of that information as to whether or not they will make recommendations to the minister for that individual uh, to be accredited to work within that area. One, one thing that would clarify is um, we have two uh, accredited groups at the moment in relation to uh, CRJI and NI Alternatives. Um, but that doesn't mean to say because they are accredited that they are accredited to work in every individual area. It actually works in geographical areas. So if either of those two organisations wish to operate within an area, they have to apply separately in relation to working in that area. So it is not a, a blanket accreditation uh, in terms of that. Um, in terms of the system operating at the moment, the, the accreditation panel, uh, in terms of the suitability panel, hasn't sat uh, for some considerable time. Uh, and indeed, the process, uh, as was alluded to earlier, was suspended back in 2016. Uh, by the then Minister of Justice because of wider reasons in relation to other pieces of work going on at the time that they think may have impacted in relation to the accreditation scheme. Um, so it hasn't sat for some time and it is something, as I say, that we will be putting it back in place and learning from the review 
uh, that will be taken forward first of all in relation to the protocol? Maybe as just to add to what Stephen said, um, there, there is in the 2007 protocol a list of criteria for which sets out who would be unsuitable uh, for membership for, for work with uh, one of the um, uh, approved schemes. And to answer your question, yes, it, it, it's the back obviously in 2007 we didn't have a minister for justice, a local minister for justice. Um, but it, it, I presume it will be the minister who will appoint the chair. Um, the previous chair was the then chief executive of the Community Relations Council, um, and he, he was joined, as Stephen said, by representatives of both probation and the Youth Justice Agency. Um, so, so, and there was also an appeals process in place, um, and there was a, an independent point of contact for advice on human rights issues and legislation. So there were checks and balances in place, but they need to be updated now. Um, and certainly the, the, the new protocol will look quite different, albeit, as I said earlier, the principles are, are pretty much sound. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and I do look forward to working through that, because I think it's until we start to see the detail, it's hard to I'll just reserve judgment for now. But thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Sinead. Um, if I can bring in Gemma Dolan. And then I'll go to Rachel Woods after that. So Gemma Dolan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a, just one question, and um, it's about: um, Is there? Can you give an overview of any restorative practices that are currently in use in the prison system? Sorry, could, you couldn't repeat. I just didn't get the second part of the question, Gemma. Sorry, sorry. Um, just, I'm looking for an overview of any restorative practices that are currently in use in the prison system, if, if there are any. In the, in the prison system? Yeah. Yes. We, um, there's uh, two, two aspects to that, and I'm sure Stephen might want to come in as well. Um, the, the, the focus in, in recent years has been on addressing uh, issues within the prison on a restorative basis. Uh, in relation to conflict between prisoners uh, and other prisoners, and also between prisoners and staff. And the uh, Northern Ireland Prison Service have trained a number of staff in restorative practices, along with the University of Ulster. And from 2018, ran a, a very successful uh, pilot in Coyle House, um, whereby there was uh, a significant reduction in the number of assaults, prisoner against prisoner, as well as prisoner against staff but also a reduction in the number of people that had to be kept apart. Um, that was one of the, the, the new things for myself when I, I joined the prison service and the, the Department of Justice in 2018. Um, it's a very complex issue for governors and prisons to keep prisoners apart who may be uh, in different gangs or different groups or family disputes. It's not just a sectarian thing or a paramilitary thing. There are a lot of uh, people who have enemies and therefore a restorative approach to addressing that has been very successful. Um, we've also tried to address uh, restorative justice by involvement of a programme called the Sycamore Tree, which is delivered by Prison Fellowship and relies on volunteers um, with a clear victim focus. Um, now, that, that work um, is, is complex and challenging and requires well-trained staff, but I believe that if the strategy leads to legislation, there is huge potential for more restorative work both within the prison setting and indeed in community disposals. Um, we have seen with the probation board, with their enhanced combination orders, that the um, inclusion of a restorative element has been very beneficial to victims. Um, and again, any restorative strategy must have victims front and centre. Um, and in no way do we want to get into a situation where we would be forcing victims to participate. I think the phrase that's been used is we should avoid a situation where we uh, where victims feel forced to forgive. We want to avoid that. Um, so in the, in the Sycamore Tree programme, for instance, it's um, representatives of victims are used. Uh, and I know of one particular case where a, a woman whose father had been the victim of a burglary, she spoke to the group uh, of, of prisoners to tell them about the impact on her and her family and her father of the burglary. And it really had an impact on, on those participants. So um, th those are the ones that I'm aware of um, in the prison system. We could talk about other ones that are available in the community, but is there anything else, Stephen, that you want to? Uh, well, certainly within the prison system, and we allude to in relation to the consultation document, we, we think there is a real opportunity in relation to expanding 
upon it so that its use, even in a restorative way, that can feed into engagement with families in relation to being part of the process in relation to prisoners uh, feeding into it, but also in relation to uh, compassionate early release, but in terms of considering uh, somebody who may fall within that scheme, and how could you use a restorative element in relation to their reintegration back into the community? So there, there are a range of areas that, and, and in terms of potential innovative approaches that we could potentially use in terms of the strategy to look to how we could expand the use of restorative practice in those types of settings. And sorry, Chair, I would just add finally, um, we, we have recently had the benefit of an input from Dr. Michelle Butler from Queen's University who is a published author on restorative practice in the prison setting. And Michelle is working with us one day a week since January to help the prison service um, develop a new restorative justice strategy. And already she's making um, very positive, constructive suggestions to how to improve our, our practice within prisons. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. It's, it's very positive. Um, and I, I do agree that the victim shouldn't feel they're forced into forgiving. So thank you, Chair. That's all my questions. Okay, thank you, Gemma. And Rachel Woods. Just can't hear Rachel at the moment. We'll just see. Can you hear me now? Yep, yeah. we can hear you now, Rachel. Sorry, thank you. Rachel. Don't know what's going on here. Um, Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Paul and Stephen, for your presentation and also the very thorough update on the consultation. So I really welcome this um, in front of us today and certainly look forward to the next steps that we're going to be taking in relation to this. Just to clarify, um, first question on the review of the protocol and the accreditation that we talked upon earlier on, will this form part of the strategy or is this going to be a separate piece of work done first? This this will be done uh, in parallel to to the strategy. So we intend to kick off the uh, the review of of the protocol first, uh, but separately we will be working on the strategy in terms of of how we would like you know the introduction of uh, restorative justice in terms of its uh, its formulation because we're, we're as we have described we're. The, 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 the protocol and the accreditation is like the golden thread running through all this, and we will be working from within the justice system from early intervention through diversion, through court-ordered sanctions, uh, then into custody and reintegration. So it's across the whole justice spectrum, and, and the protocol will, will feed all the way through that. Thank you. Um, it was just to clarify that. Um, a couple more questions. Um, first of all, just on the an update on core, so the Centre of Restorative Excellence, and I know the consultation document did mention it, but didn't focus too much on it. I've been asking some questions on this, and I know that officials have been engaged on plans to develop this. Do you have any update on where we're at with core? Yes. Um, the the, the, we believe that the Centre of Restorative Excellence will be a, a central part of the strategy, um, and to that end, the Department of Justice commissioned a feasibility study, which reported in 2018. Um, then, during 2019, we had a number of meetings of a committee to, to look at the outworkings of that. Um, however, we are, um, we are aware that just this week, um, because of other competing priorities, um, the Attack and Paramilitarism Programme has not identified any finance for uh, work on core for the 21-22 year. Um, so while work will continue on it, we think that the bulk of the work of the implementation of core, which the Attack and Paramilitarism Programme is fully committed to still, uh, that will take place in 2022-2023. Uh, um, but yes, core, uh, I, I recall that the member asked me a similar question about core uh, this time last year. And I, I said at that stage that the feasibility study concluded that it would be better to have a physical centre rather than a, uh, just a, a virtual centre that we've all got used to, um, and to have a building which would be uh, focused on much more than just justice. It would take in all aspects of restorative practice, such as in schools, at community disputes that Stephen talked about in relation to housing, 
um, also potentially within health, um, and would bring a consistent approach to standards of practice, um, to accreditation and to training. So we certainly see CORE as being a very important part of this strategy. Um, but just as I say, it, it's, there won't be any significant developments in CORE in the 21-22 year. No, Stephen, you want to add to that? Uh, ju just, uh, I think we would acknowledge uh, and share certainly the committee's view in relation to we, we would ideally like to be further on than we are at the moment. There are a number of competing reasons in relation to uh, why, why we're not as far on as we, we would have liked to have been. Um, some of that are down to, to pressures in relation to uh, the department in general, but my division in particular in relation to looking at other areas. Obviously, we've been working in relation to, to the, the adult restorative justice strategy, but we've also been working on a number of other strategies um, in terms of that. And also, uh, you know, there, there are other factors that have unfortunately impacted us in relation to other staffing pressures within the department because of other notable reasons in terms of the pandemic and, and Brexit, etc., that, that have placed additional pressures on us um, in terms of that. One, one of the aspects is that, that in terms of the sequences, and there's, there's a series of pieces of work that we've alluded to, one is the review of the protocol. The second is the finalisation of the strategy. In parallel with that, we want to be progressing core as well. Uh, in terms of that, we already know the broad principles in relation to uh, what we would like to see in place. Um, as Paul has indicated, we have a working group uh, in place to take that forward. Uh, in terms of that, and we're also working with the executive office in relation to the creation of the fund under A9 uh, of the Fresh Start Plan, which which has to be in place to actually fund the core moving forward. So th there are a series of uh, linkages here, uh, but over the next 12 months. Uh, we, we want to make real progress that, so that we could have uh, a physical building uh, in terms uh, in place for the next financial beginning of the next financial year. Thank you, and it um, certainly answers a number of the questions. And uh, I suppose I, I'm eager to, to, to see this happening. You know, we've been talking about this for a very long time, but um, I appreciate the other pressures. And I suppose you've already touched upon it, but funding in A9, obviously funding is key in the ability of any strategy going forward to ensure that it actually happens and as well as resource. So on A9, um, if you could give us an update just on what is going on and what work's going on with, with the executive office with regards to A9, um, and if there was any dedicated funding put in for A9 in this year's budget, um, and also, finally, if there have been any discussions of potentially taking A9 out of the executive office and putting it firmly within the Department of Justice. Um. Uh, the answer, the answer to that is 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 no. Um, in terms of naturally, the the executive office is in the lead in relation to A9. I, I do know that they have brought together an options paper in relation to looking at how you know the the outline proposals in relation to what the fund would look like. Uh, in terms of that, and we have done a piece of work for them in relation to mapping out. Uh, let's say, across, across the public sector in relation to the funding that is made available uh, to restorative practice in general and what we are aware of, both within the justice system and out with the justice system. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, I, I'm not aware in relation to what stage that options paper is at in terms of consideration uh, with the special advisors and ministers, but, but I do know that the executive office are looking at that and the shape of a fund and how that would be structured moving forward. I, I, one thing I would add, Chair, is that, that with the core and the fund, um, the, the, and just, just to put it into context, the, the justice sector in terms of funding is a very small drop compared to the overall funding of, of the wider public sector and the Department of Communities in general would be the largest funder of the use of restorative practice generally, you know, at a community level. 
Thank you, and I um, absolutely appreciate that answer. I certainly uh, direct your comments and questions towards the executive office in terms of that feasibility study in the options paper. Um, and one, I suppose one last question. It says in the paper that there will be a need for a public awareness campaign on restorative justice and code of practices, which I completely agree with. Um, and that would contribute to increased acceptance and uptake. But in terms of the current situation we're in, could you outline what the current barriers are, um, and if there are any that you've identified through the consultation on the acceptance of restorative justice practices? I would like I maybe kick off. I totally agree with the member that um, uh, um, a publicity campaign and a greater understanding of restorative practice is essential to pave the way for an acceptance that restorative practice, as has been said earlier, is not a soft option. Um, I think that there are a number of steps that could be taken. I think everybody has a responsibility to look at this um, in the same way as, for instance, Justice Gillen and his team looked at the issue in relation to serious sexual offending, because um, there were very strong opinions expressed that um, restorative approach for serious sexual offences is not appropriate because of the power and control issues in relation to perpetrators uh, and the fact that you know um, victims um, can often find the potential for re-traumatisation if they were to be expected to participate in a restorative process. And certainly that's something we want to avoid. But I think the reality is now, and, and, and in the Gillen report, these stats were, were very harsh. Um, um, 17 per, less than 17 per cent of female victims of sexual crime report them to the police. Um, and of those crimes that are reported to the police, um, le, um, 40 per cent um, are not proceeded with. So the current system isn't serving the needs of victims and the outcomes for victims, for perpetrators and for the community uh, under the current adversarial system um, is, 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 are not good and should be improved. And certainly the um, Criminal Justice Inspection in Northern Ireland, when they did a review in 2018, said that the Department of Justice should be creative and innovative. And, and I hope that um, uh, elected members would, would share that, that view, that you know, we know about the problems with delay uh, in the current system. We know about the fact that victims aren't satisfied um, with the current system. We know that there are um, improvements that can be made in reoffending rates for people who do come into the system. So we're very keen to try and divert those people who don't need to come into the criminal justice system away from it. And we think that the success that we've seen with young people could be replicated for, for adults. Um, so I think we, we need a, a full commitment across society to try and get better outcomes in line with the programme for government. Um, where we have a safer community, where we respect the law and each other. Um, and, and I would certainly look for uh, full support from not just, this, not just this committee, but also indeed the, the full assembly, um, the executive and, and the minister and, and so on. I don't know if you want to add anything, Stephen. Thank you. Um, sorry, any, any support that I can lend to speeding up the justice system, making it more victim friendly and getting better outcomes and diverting people away from the criminal justice system that do not need to be there. You have my full support in that. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, Linda was just, I think, wanting to come back in to make a small point. Chair, the point's been covered. It's fine. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, if there's no other points to be made. Can I thank Paul and Stephen very much for, for coming to the committee um, today and giving us that briefing and I'm sure we'll continue to engage in this area. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, members, so um, the Department will provide us with the, the draft Adult Restorative Justice Strategy and the Associated Action Plan for the Committee to consider in due course, and we can pick those issues up whenever we are in receipt of that. So, item five um, on the agenda is the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill, um, pages 193 to 263 of the meeting pack. So, uh, we know that uh, this bill became law, uh, it received royal assent and became law on the 1st of March. So the Department has responded to the Committee's questions regarding the statutory domestic abuse offence guidance. It has indicated that the Police will have its operational guidance finalised around June 
and that will be shared uh, with the committee. The PPS is currently preparing detailed operational guidance for prosecutors and administrative staff, which will be used as the basis for its training programme. It has indicated that the guidance is for internal use only, and they are unable to share this externally. Uh, it does plan to publish an updated domestic abuse policy reflecting the requirements of the new provisions in late 2021, early 2022. So the department has confirmed that it will share any future revised guidance with the committee ahead of publication, and is content to take on board uh, the views of the committee on any changes that may be required outside of this. So it has also included additional text in the body of the guidance regarding Clause 28, and this will be revised in due course to reflect the outworkings of Clause 29. It has indicated that it is aiming for November for introduction of the offence, but that is dependent on the work around training, system changes and the awareness raising aspect. So, members, if you are content, um, we can note this information unless there is any further clarity needed by members. Um, Rachel Woods, I see your hand up. Thank you, Chair. And of course, just a uh, first instance to welcome the bill becoming an act. I think it's uh, really good that it's happened um, so quickly after final stage. Um, I suppose my comment is in relation to the answer given on clause 28 of the bill with the additional text has been included. Um, just to clarify, if that additional text is in the annex that we have, um, because it's not, the question wasn't really in relation to Clause 29. Um, it was in relation to Clause 28 and the lack of information on the waiver and not on the review and, and other other project, you know, the other works that the department would take um, on Clause 29. Okay, well, we can check that, Rachel, and, and if we don't have that, we can, if members are happy, we'll raise that with the department to get that clarity. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Well, members, we, we'll we'll ask for an update um, in September. You know, to get one by September in terms of the progress that's being made around this bill and all of the various issues that we've just discussed, just to, to keep it as an item that we're uh, monitoring. Okay. So, item uh, six on the agenda then. Um, departmental officials attended the meeting on the fourteenth of January to provide a briefing on a proposed LCM in relation to the protection of the police and public. Courts and Sentencing Bill, now known as the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. Uh, at that time, the committee agreed to consider the matter further when the bill uh, is available and when the executive has reached a position on the proposal to extend certain provisions in the bill to Northern Ireland by way of an LCM. So the department um, has advised that the introduction of the bill at Westminster has been delayed um, and confirmed that the executive considered and agreed the proposal to bring forward the LCM at its meeting on the 14th of January. The Department also advised that consent would be required for additional provisions, which will uh, provide powers uh, for the police uh, in England and Wales to apply to the courts for an order to access special procedure material that may relate to the location of human remains. The Committee noted these additional provisions and agreed to uh, consider the proposal for the LCM further when the bill and a time scale for laying it were available. The Department has now provided a further written briefing advising that consent will be required for further provisions to be included in the bill, which relate to the powers to extract information from mobile devices, and these are outlined in paragraphs 7 to 10 of the Clerk's memo uh, of page 266 of your meeting pack, and further information is provided in additional correspondence from the Department in the tabled pack. The additional correspondence includes the text of the relevant clauses in the forthcoming bill, which the Home Office has agreed can be shared with the Committee in confidence, but it is not for wider circulation. So, Members, uh, we are asking to note the update um, and then uh, agree to consider the proposed LCM further when the bill and information on the timescale for laying the LCM have been provided by the Department, and we can pick it up again at that stage unless other members um, want some more clarity. Um, Linda Dillon. And how to propose Sorry, Linda, we just dropped off there in terms of your, your call, so we'll try we'll we'll just try bring you back in again. Okay, just just having some technical problems I think here in 
in the room. I'm not sure it's actually at your end, Linda, because our screens have went blank here. So if members can just bear with us. We were at the beach there a minute ago, and now we're back in Stormont. I see that. I'd prefer the beach. Okay, members, apologies for this. We'll just see if we can get the technology. Yeah, I know I, I can see the members on my screen here, but obviously the other screens are now com completely off. So. Be in the meter. Paul, is there any items of business you and I want to put through now? <laughs> <laughs> Or two members wouldn't make it a quorum, actually. So. <laughs> it wouldn't be like us to push our luck. <laughs> okay. Okay, members, so just. Technically, how easy it is for them over here. Okay, yeah. so I can, I, I can now hear Sinead, so. What were um, you saying about a Sinead? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not sure if he's, we all were still here at the, and, and it was, it was yourselves who were lost there for a while. Yes, I think it was at our end this time. So um, yes, I can hear you now, Linda. So please, if you want to come in there on item six or agenda item six. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Chair. So not sure whether this is, I mean, if, if this has only been shared with the community or the, the committee rather in confidence and, and can't be wider, this may not be the appropriate time to ask for this, but I would have liked a view from the Human Rights Commission and from potentially from the Attorney General as well on whether this is ECHR compliant. Um, I mean, we may have to wait until we can actually share this information, obviously, wider before we can get that view. And if that's the case, that that's fair enough. I can I can wait until that point, but it is something that I would like to get before we would move for any further with it. Okay. Um, if it's helpful, committee, we can probably share the policy intent. We may not be able to share the actual wording of the clauses, but we probably could share the policy intent behind them in the meantime, but we can check and see exactly what we could provide to them. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Okay. Well, Thank you. If we can, then um, we'll, we'll seek the view of the Human Rights Commission and the Attorney General in respect of the, the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. And Rachel, I see your hand up there, if I can bring you in. Thank you, Chair. It's on the same matter with regard to sharing the policy intent, if possible, with a Children's Commissioner. Okay. Happy to do that. Okay, members, if you're content, then we'll we'll do that, and we'll also pick this up then in, in due course. So, uh, agenda item number seven. Um, this is the statutory rule around the explosives um, regulations, 2021. Um, so the relevant pages, members, are pages 292 to 301. Uh, this statutory rule makes minor amendments to the Explosives Appointment of Authorities and Enforcement Regulations Northern Ireland 2015 in order to implement the Northern Ireland Stroke Ireland Protocol uh, in the Withdrawal Agreement. The 2015 regulations are required to be amended to ensure that they continue to operate effectively in Northern Ireland following the end of the implementation period. Uh, the uh, amendments replace references to member state with an appropriate term that includes Northern Ireland only and an EEA state. Uh, the rule will also ensure uh, that the uh, CLP regulation, which sets out internationally accepted definitions and criteria to identify the hazards of chemicals and requires duty holders to classify, label and package hazardous uh, chemicals before placing them on the market, in accordance with its provision, continue to apply. The examiner for statutory rule has no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the rule, and the examiner's uh, report, which was published on the 2nd of March, is at pages 70 to 77 of the uh, table pack. So, members, this rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure. Um, 
the department has advised that there isn't any changes to the policy content uh, whenever the SL1 had previously been looked at um, by the committee. Um, so obviously, members, at this stage, we need to be indicating uh, whether or not we're content with this rule, and then I need to put formal questions to members. So on this issue, um, I'm going to bring in Paul Frew. Thank you, uh, Chair. And, uh uh, given, uh, in all good conscience, given my party's stance uh, with regards to Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, given the damage that the Northern Ireland Protocol is doing uh, to the citizens of Northern Ireland and the attitude of the European, uh, the EU, with regards to the population of Northern Ireland, not least the episode we had where they tried to block vaccines coming into Northern Ireland, vaccines that we didn't even need, by the way. Uh, but Given that stance, that attitude, and given my party's uh, position on this, I cannot in all good conscience vote uh, in support of this SR today. Okay. Okay, Paul, um, thank you for your contribution. Is there any other members that wish to comment? Um, Paul has outlined the DUP's position on this. We'll be actively voting against the statutory rule at today's committee, but I want to open that up for any other members that wish to, to make any comment just before I put the, the question and then turn it to a vote. No. Chair, can I come in there? Yes, Sinead Bradley. It probably doesn't require stating, but our party position will be to honour the treaty and all protocols that have brought us here, new deck and new approach um, protocols, and, and I think it's important we honour and understand why we're all around this table and given the, the opportunity to take a vote. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other members? Chair. Yes, um, I think that's Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. M much in the same vein as what Sinead has just said, I think when we sign up to agreements, we honour them. Um, if others choose to break agreements, that, that is for them to to deal with. And, and I think that in terms of the EU and, and what Paul Frey has outlined, they very clearly apologise for, for making a mistake. I wish that others who didn't live up to agreements would follow their lead, but that's not where we're at, and, and I don't want to, I suppose, get into pettiness around this, but I do think when we make agreements, we, we honour them. That's that's where we're at, and there's been no objection in relation to this, this statutory rule laid to date in, in the committee, and I think we should just go forward and, and welcome the opportunity to vote on it. Okay. Um, Doug Beattie. Chair, sure, thank you. Um, I mean, I think it's important that no, no, we, we, we have our voices heard and uh, we we have a vote and then we, we decide where we go. And I think that vote will be will be split in many ways. I think um, we all understand that and we know that. We're all grown-ups and we're all adults. Um, some people will support the protocol. Um, my party does not support the protocol. The reality being is no matter what is said in this room today, no matter what would be said on the floor uh, of the Assembly, the Westminster government will bring forward this legislation um, anyway. Uh, but but I, I can't support the protocol. It's damaging uh, to Northern Ireland, uh, and I can't vote for anything that damages uh, Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, any other members want to comment just at this stage? Okay, I think we've covered all the parties. Um, if Rachel wants to indicate she wants to speak, I'm happy to bring her in just before I move it on to a vote. But uh, if not, then I'm, I'm content that we would move that forward. Obviously, Paul Frey has outlined the DUP position on this. And just, I suppose, for the sake of the record, um, we're not breaking any agreement in voting this way because we never supported it in the first place and, and voted against it at Westminster and continue to oppose the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, and uh, not one single Unionist uh, representative in this Assembly supports the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so it's just in terms of um, the comments that were made about honouring agreements. Um, if, that, if that was an agreement that we supported, we would honour it, but we haven't and we need to be consistent in respect of it. So can I put that then formally to, to members? Um, uh, let, let me just read out the question uh, and then members can vote. That, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2021 forward slash 37 
the Explosives Appointment of Authorities and Enforcement Amend Amendment EU Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and has no objection to the rule. All those in favour, if you can indicate, and then we will formally record uh, those that are voting in favour. So, I'm going by the screens. Uh, let, let me. I'll, I'll just go through the the folks, and then you can orally do that. So, let me bring in Shania Bradley. Agreed. Okay, Rachel Woods. Agreed. Linda Dillon. Agreed, sir. Sure. Okay, and Linda's also um, had a vote delegated to her on behalf of one of her party colleagues, so we'll take her vote as counting uh, twice. Yeah. Uh, Gemma Dolan. Agreed. Okay. Um, so that's five votes in favour. Can I bring in Paul Frew at this stage? Against. Doug Beatty. Not against. Uh, and I'll vote against on my behalf. And uh, Gordon Dunn had delegated his vote uh, to me. Uh, so members, the, the motion in that respect passes uh, five votes to four. Um, and obviously that then is the official position of the, uh, the Justice Committee by way of a majority vote. Um, this is a statutory rule subject to the negative resolution procedure. Uh, so in that respect, uh, this committee won't take forward then any action uh, officially by way of wanting to uh, pray against that by way of a prayer of annulment. That, that obviously is something that is open to any member of the Assembly. Uh, if they wish to, to do that and take this issue into the floor of the Assembly. But uh, that concludes the official Justice Committee's deliberation and consideration of this statutory rule. So thank you, members, for that. Item 8, in terms of uh, the next uh, agenda, is the Postal Administration Rules. At the meeting on the 3rd of December, the Committee for Justice considered a proposal by the Department of Justice to make a statutory rule to provide the procedure for the Special Postal Administration Regime. The Postal Services Act of 2011 allows for the designation of a postal operator as a universal postal service uh, provider to be responsible for the minimum service of delivery of letters six days per week across all UK postal addresses at uniform affordable prices. Uh, at present, Royal Mail is the only designated universal service provider. The 2011 Act puts in place a special postal administration regime designed to ensure the continuation or the continuance of the universal postal service in the event that a company providing that service is at risk of entering insolvency proceedings. So the committee agreed to seek the views for the Committee of Economy on the proposal as responsibility for insolvency. Policy rests uh, with the insolvency service in the Department for Economy. The committee also agreed to request clarity from the Department of Justice on the up-to-date position of Companies House and the Enforcement of Judgments Office on the proposed rule. So, members, um, the Committee for the Economy has advised that the Department of the Economy has indicated that the rules will bring Northern Ireland into line with the rest of the UK, where similar rules have been introduced, and the Department of Justice has advised that Companies House and the Enforcements of Judgments uh, Office are content for the rule to be made. So this statutory rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure. So if members are able to indicate whether they are content with the proposal for the statutory rule or whether any information needs to be uh, required, if we are content, then it will come back to the committee for then the formal consideration of it. So members content then um, with this statutory rule, and then we'll um, bring it forward whenever we have that laid in the assembly for the committee to consider. Uh, item nine then is the new strategic program for government update and progress. The department has provided a progress update on the development of the new strategic uh, program for government, which will build on the outcomes-based approach that has defined strategic planning across the public sector since 2016 and reflect the messages contained in New Decade, New Approach. The Executive Office is leading an eight-week eight -week public consultation on a draft outcomes framework consisting of nine statements of societal well-being. A 12-week consultation on an equality impact assessment is also taking place. The aim is to have a final version of the framework agreed by the Executive uh, around the end of April with a view to bringing forward a complete programme incorporating the key actions and strategies before the summer. It is anticipated that the Department of Justice is the natural lead for the outcome 
um, which is everyone feels safe, we all respect the law and each other, uh, and it is also named for input into three other outcomes. While the public consultation is ongoing, officials will consider the development of a preliminary actions under the proposed priority areas outlined in the draft uh, framework to achieve that outcome. This work will be undertaken alongside the development of the Department's business plan for 2021-22. When the final version of the framework is agreed by the Executive, the Department will develop a draft action plan to support the agreed outcomes uh, and will share this with the Committee. Does whether members wish to submit any views or comments on the outcome, which uh, is likely to be the responsibility of DOJ uh, or the wider framework, or whether any further information or clarity is required prior to considering the draft action plan? If we are content, we will consider the draft action plan when it comes forward. But, um, Mr Frew? Yeah, just very quickly, not to hold up the meeting. Um, someone had, uh, had an interest in, in this with regards to the negotiations uh, last year. Uh, I took part in the Programme for Government piece. I think what is very important for us going forward is that the, prog- the Programme for Government remains at a high level with regards to um, framework. Uh, it doesn't become a straitjacket, it becomes a direction of travel. Uh, and, and what it should do is not only point the population in the direction that the government is going, but also uh, enable and encourage uh, the breaking down of silos and the working together in a collegiate way with all departments. Uh, so when I read the, the, the framework and the outcomes, that's what I want to see. I want to see the linkage with multiple departments and then what I would love to see is the budget process aligning with our programme for government so whilst that's not necessarily justice related chair I just think it was important to state that that you know programme for government should be a very important document uh, but it shouldn't be a straitjacket and it should be high level encouraging uh, individual ministers and departments to work together thank you okay Okay, well, members, we'll note those comments too for Mr. Free, but we'll pick this up whenever the draft action plan then is brought forward to us. Um, item 10 is the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. It's just again to provide an update. Members will be fully aware at this stage of all of the different aspects, but the Minister has provided an update in uh, respect to recent developments around this scheme. Um, work including development of an application form and an IT system to support online applications is on schedule and uh, NIJAC has completed the recruitment process for short term. Members of the Victims Payments Board and the 26 members were formally sworn in on the 23rd of February. The appointment of Mr Justice McAlinden as President of the Board was also announced with effect from the 1st of March. Following a procurement competition, Capita has been appointed to design the medical assessment service. The President of the Board believes that it is important for applicants to have access to guidance on how medical assessments will be carried out. Having engaged with the relevant sector groups over recent uh, days, he has concluded that the scheme should not be opened until the medical assessment service has been fully designed and agreed by the Victims Payments Board. Uh, This means that the scheme will not open for applications in March as had been previously anticipated. The Minister has also provided an update on efforts to secure funding for the payments and recent meetings with other Executive Ministers and the Secretary of State uh, for Northern Ireland. So, members, it is there for us in terms of that information uh, to note, and I am happy if members are wishing to comment. So, if I can bring in um, Linda Dillon, and then we will go to Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Just first of all, to say that I welcome the fact that the board has been appointed and, and the president formally appointed as, as, as the president rather than the and I think that it's important in, in terms of giving the, the victims confidence that we are moving forward with this and that they are actually going to be delivered for it. And that is that is really important. And even the fact obviously that there was engagement with, with that sector around the issue of, of opening the application scheme and in the absence of guidance for the the medical examinations that there was good um cooperation as I understand it, which I think is all all positive and shows that they are that there is a, a victim centered approach here, which is really important. Could I suggest, Chair, that we um informally the committee would meet with that reference group which is made up of all of the different 
um, representative groups in, in terms of um, the Victims and Survivors Service, the, the Victims Forum, um, ELI, RFJ, and, and a number of other organizations. I think it would be good for us to hear directly from them if there are any issues. And, and I'm hoping, given that we haven't heard any, um, we have also studies included in that, um, given that we haven't heard anything that that's a good sign that, that they're content with how things are moving forward. But if they have concerns, I think that we should give them an opportunity to meet with the committee to raise those concerns. And I think it would be it would be good to do that in an informal setting, um, which allows allows them to, to have a a more free flowing conversation with us as committee members. If if the committee would be agreeable, I think that would be a good thing for us to do and in, in, in moving forward. And also just to make the point again, and, and I did make the chamber this week during the budget debate, obviously there are concerns around Fonten and where the Fonten will come from, but that is a political battle. And, and I think that's something that we should be united on in terms of our ask of the British government. It is not an issue for the victims to concern themselves for we have to deliver for them. And and that's, you know, that there, there, there is not only... Obviously, we have a, a judge and a court ruling, but that's not what it's about. We have to deliver for them because it's the right thing to do. And that's where we need to go forward. And, and I think we can be united on all of those issues on our ask of the of the British government in terms of their responsibility and of the fact that we want to deliver for all of these factors right across the board. So if you would be agreeable, Chair, I think we should do the informal meeting and that would be all committee members, not just the Chair and Deputy Chair. Um, I'll bring in some of the other members and then we can pick up on, on these different action points. So, Sinead Bradley and then Rachel. Um, Rachel Chair, sorry, thank you. Uh, no, Chair, just to echo that, I, I really think I would just like to put on record um, that I'm pleased to see that progress has been made in terms of building up the mechanics around, around this. And we are united on this in terms of um, everybody wants to see the resolution to the funding of it. And um, I suppose in, in addition to Linda's point about um, inviting those victims in, which I think is a really good idea and it would be a very productive thing to do. Um, I also just wonder, are there any other um, shared, um, the weight of this committee could be used in any way uh, by the executive office or others for us to to show our united front on this matter, uh, be it directly to the Secretary of State. I, I just think we should collectively come together and and use our strengths in any way we can to support these victims. And I'd be open to hearing um, through the, yourself, Chair, anything we as a committee might do um, to, to express that united view, I, I certainly th would be welcome and would propose joining on it. Thank you. Um, Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. And I um, suppose just like others to welcome the steps that have been taken so far. Um, it does seem encouraging that there has been engagement with the sector in this and that it um, definitely does need to be victim centred. As Linda said, I would be happy to meet with the groups as Linda has um, put there, but I do have a few comments just on the context of this, on the content of this letter. Um, with regard to the estimate total of the cost of payments over the lifetime of the scheme, it says that it ranges from 600 million to 1.2 billion. Um, but certainly with the central estimate of 848 million, which excludes administrative costs. I would like to know what the basis was for these numbers to be worked out and based on what assumptions, um, if possible. And obviously, we, we do have the elephant in the room there in terms of where this money is coming from. So any update on future meetings or current meetings with the Secretary of State and the Executive Office, I would certainly welcome some information on. Okay. Okay, I think that... To everyone, um, Paul Frey. Yeah, yeah, well, again, the the six hundred, I suppose, with myself and Gemma's input into the finance committee again, the six hundred million to one point two billion came from the government actuary department. That's who has produced those figures. This is the first time I've actually heard simple estimate figure of eight hundred and forty-eight million, uh, which is interesting. I'm not sure whether I've just threw a dart at the centre of that range, uh, but. Uh, it'd be interesting. What what struck me from this letter, this latest letter, is the 
80 years of lifespan. Um, I'd be interested to know just how they're getting the 80 years now. Of course, uh, four score and ten and all of that, but but a lot of these people are quite elderly already. Uh, so I just, uh, if they best estimate that the scheme may have a life of up to 80 years, uh, but of course the expenditure would peak strongly in the initial years, especially if there's an upfront cost uh, and pension. But but it, the 80 years just struck me when I read it. Um, I don't know what sort of formula they've they've used to come up with that, or whether it's just that'll be the up the the, op, the optimum time. Uh, but no, yes, I, I think we need to. We have made progress. We should be welcomed, uh, absolutely, and we need to we need to get the money down to these people as soon as possible. And yes, because uh, victims who will avail of this pension come from all over the British Isles and further afield, in fact. Then I do think that you know there is a, an onus on the Secretary of State and uh, and on the uh, sovereign government to provide for these victims because uh, they haven't got sufficient provision over the years and they've lived with all those injuries. I'll leave it there, Chair. Okay, and um, Doug, I see your hand was up a minute ago, but I, I see it's down now. Yeah, Chair, sorry. Yeah, because that's because Paul answered really the, the question I was going to ask. Um, and it's really a combination of both what Paul was saying and what Rachel was saying, is that this estimate did come from the Government Actuary Department. But what we need to see is what the assumptions that were given to the Actuary Department. So the Department for Finance or the TEO office or somebody gave them assumptions and that's how they come up uh, with this um, figure and I'm I'm hearing this figure could be based on seventeen thousand people with permanent disabilities. I think that's a staggering number uh, of 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 people with a permanent disablement uh, based on our on our troubles. So I think those assumptions um, that that created this from the government actuary department uh, would be really useful to get to get sight of. Okay. Well, listen. There's a range of different action points there. So I let. And let the committee staff just pull those together, and um, so that we can take them forward. In terms of an informal meeting, I, I've I've no problem with that. Um, I suppose there's an area here that the executive office, um, you know, DOJ is responsible for this administration of the scheme, but there's also a, a role for the executive office on this. Um, and I just I would want to make sure that we're we're not overlapping in some of our our work. So if, if members are happy, we'll get. The committee clerk to liaise with the executive office clerk, just to identify you know what are the different work streams that that committee has been involved in and any engagement, so that we can try and coordinate how best we can continue to to carry out our role on this. So, um, if we can come back to this next week when we pull together some of these different points and we'll consider a paper on it, um, and then we can formalise that if if members are agreeable to do that. Agreed. Okay. Okay. So, members, there's some correspondence. Um, just to to pick up on. Uh, there's nine items. I'm just going to highlight two. There's a response from the committee's request for an update on how the department is engaging on and handling the wider issues relating to the enforcement of the health protection regulations, including engagement with the committee. And the department has stated that operational policing decisions on enforcing public health restrictions are a matter for the chief constable, uh, and uh, he is accountable to the policing board. Any questions relating then to police enforcement should be directed to the chief constable, and any questions on the regulations should uh, be directed to the minister of health. Uh, in relation to the wider approach, the department has indicated that the dedicated adherence work stream, led by the permanent secretary, provides strategic input to adherence issues. And officials will provide further updates on this work stream in due course. Uh, DOJ officials are also fully engaged on a range of cross departmental groups where issues of enforcement and wider societal adherence are one of uh, a number of considerations. So, members, that information is there uh, to note, unless there are any other comments that members wish to make in respect of it. We will note it. Okay, and uh, the other item then there's a request um, for a meeting uh, with uh, the chairperson, myself, uh, and other committee members at an appropriate time regarding the Justice Minister's proposal to increase the maximum tariffs 
for death from unlawful uh, driving. Now, the Minister has advised the Committee of her decision, uh, which we got in a letter on the 17th of February, that she is commissioning uh, work to prepare the necessary legislation for introduction in the uh, next mandate uh, on this. So, members, I, I have spoken to um, Mr McCrossan, the, the West Huron MLA, on this. Uh, I am happy to facilitate a, an informal meeting um, with Daniel and his constituent, and if there are other members of the committee that wish to join that, um, I, I will provide the invite so that everyone can be invited to it, and, uh, and you're welcome to join it. But I'm happy to take forward an informal meeting, and we can circulate um, the, uh, the the meeting, and any member that wishes to, to take part in it, um, you'll be invited to do so, and, and you'll be welcome to attend. If, if members are happy that I can do that, then I'll take it forward on that basis. We, we'll. We'll take a note of the, the meeting when it happens, and then that note can be provided to members that aren't able to take part, and then that'll that'll be something that we can refer to in the future as a committee. Our members can tend to action then all the other items of correspondence as outlined in the cover sheet. Content. Agreed. Okay, I don't have any chairman's business. Um, is there a, any other business that any other member wishes to raise at this stage? Okay. Sorry. Yes, Linda. Chair, um, just in relation to, was an issue came to the the committee uh, a few weeks ago in relation to the the, or more than a few weeks ago actually, in relation to the inquests of the people who die outside the jurisdiction, which is something that happens in in, in the twenty six counties and and across the water. In other, in other areas in the north, it's the only area that at this moment in time doesn't facilitate that. Now, the department told us at that time that they were doing a piece of work that would be complete, complete in January, and I'm just wondering if we ask for an update on where that's at, because I know that there are a number of um, of constituents and, and of our, our own reps who are dealing with people who are impacted and affected by this, and we haven't had any update. So if we if we could formally write to the department as a committee chair and ask for an update in relation to that. So it's the, the, the Coroners and Justice Act two thousand and nine in relation to inquests being carried out here in the north of deaths that happen outside the jurisdiction. Okay. We can do that. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. If there's no other business, then our next meeting is scheduled. Um Today, week at 2 p.m., and that'll be held in room 30. And of course, for those that wish to join via the Starley facility, that will be available. So, okay, thank you, members. I'll adjourn the meeting at this stage. Thank you. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Program signed.